so uh, I'd like now to introduce um, uh, Sabina Leonelli. Sabina, are you here? Hi, Sophia. Yeah, I'm here. Hi there. Um, so uh, Sabina is professor, and again, for the sake of uh, time, I won't give a whole CV because you can find it. There's professor in philosophy and history of science at the University of Exeter, where she co-directs the Center for the Study of the Life Sciences and leads the governance strand of the Institute of Data Science and AI. And she's also a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute among other, play, other things. <laughs> so um, uh, her topic is going to be on intelligent data linkage and distributed semantics from big data. So thank you very much and please get started. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much, Sophia. I'm not quite sure why, but the system is now not letting me share the screen. So I'm gonna have to go in and out for a second. I'm really sorry. Um, it was set up for it, but um, it seems to be playing out. Just one second. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I'm very sorry about this. Um, not quite sure why this happened, but I can now <clears throat> share my screen. Um, excellent. So I'm hoping you can all uh, see the screen properly now. So very glad to be joining this conference. And um, I will be shifting the tone a little bit uh, coming from indeed uh, the humanities and the part of the humanities, which actually is looking at um, in social sciences, which is looking at uh, what is going on in data science and uh, providing expertise um, to go into the making of data science systems. And what I will be uh, talking about specifically is the question of semantics. So how do we organize data and whether that still um, has uh, a lot of impact on uh, the way in which data science systems and AI are functioning. I will argue that that's indeed the case. And I will look at what can we learn in thinking about um, these systems uh, from fields like the philosophy of science, which have uh, had discussions for a long time around how to deal with language when organizing uh, different kinds of results, including data. So um, first of all, um, sorry, I'm just trying to minimize this. Yeah, first of all, uh, just to uh, remind ourselves that there is a long uh, standing um, discussion around the AI enabled mining of big data as becoming a sort of alternative to extensive human intervention and the kind of decision making that is currently required uh, in the context of data analysis. And I think this is a story that many people within the data science community per se are not quite buying in a wholesome way, and, but it's still very popular in the popular press, of course, and, and in kind of policy arenas. Um, yeah, so um, one of the things that um, I think has become quite clear uh, over the last decades for sure, is that um, big data in and of themselves are not necessarily a reliable evidence base for computational analysis. And uh, first of all, because the myth that uh, all big data are fair, so they're fundable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, has in fact um, been um, dismantled. So a lot of work needs into making data accessible in that way and reusable in that way. And also, this doesn't really guarantee that there's gonna be an ethical and responsible use of that data at the same time. So the question of fairness of the data comes on top of this criteria. Also, the idea that big data are comprehensive um, has been heavily criticized. Um, the idea that big data actually automatically sort of counters bias in data collection interpretation has sort of gone off the table um, because uh, we know that it takes more than just triangulation of data to uh, be able to counter this kind of bias. And also, um, 
the idea that uh, debates over sampling as redundant, are redundant because we have so much data now, I've also gone off the table because um, we know that in fact, in many areas data are scarce and there's still a very big question around which kinds of representativeness do we attach to data. So one of the ways in which we've been trying with uh, my group and my institute to counter some of this hype is to carry out some empirical studies, qualitative studies, of how big data actually are being mobilized, assembled and integrated in research and with which implications. So uh, to this aim, we've actually just carried out, in fact, this is a project that contrary to Maria's one is just finished rather than just starting, and a very big study financed by the European uh, Commission called the Data Science Project, looking at the epistemology, data intensive science. And this was particularly looking at tracking the ways in which data move around the system. So move away from sites in which they're being produced, move into sites in which they're disseminated, and primarily we looked at databases and data platforms and then moved into spaces in which they're being interpreted and reused in a variety of ways. We looked at databases because we consider them to be a really interesting window on the conditions, which can be material, conceptual, or institutional, needed to actually make data uh, reusable. And of course, as part of that, uh, we looked at the labels and the software, but particularly the labels used uh, in this process. So um, one of the things, of course, that we learned, which I think is um, well understood by now, is that uh, the tools and the skills required to reuse data are incredibly complex. Uh, this table gives you just a little sample of that. It's a paper that um, we published um, regarding the uh, field of plant biology, where we're looking at least at providing a typology of the different kinds of tools for meta management uh, that um, data users will need to at least be aware of. Uh, to be able to um, design uh, their data management systems and be able to reuse data effectively. And as you can see here, these are numerals. And of course, which examples of software and tools uh, go under each category also keep shifting in time. So it's very, very difficult to command for any one researcher. Um, and indeed, uh, we did uncover the fact that the whole landscape of data infrastructures was very, very confusing, particularly for data users. This is partly because uh, data infrastructures and databases tend to have a nested structure. Many of them depend on each other, but these uh, links of dependency are not really institutionalized. I mean, they're just happen to be an accident of how these databases grew, and who knew who, and who was friends with who, and how these databases was funded. And, so, and also because many of the databases were actually outgrowth of individual projects. So it, this landscape becomes very obscure for users, and also it becomes unclear where a database ceases to be maintained, what are the implications of that for the whole data landscape, and this makes issues of intelligibility and opacity, which we already know to be very strong in AI systems, be even more pronounced in the uh, data case. Now, what I want to focus on briefly today is in fact the role of the labels that we use to classify uh, data. And one of the things that I've been defending as a philosopher is the idea that, in fact, these labels, what we call semantic systems, sometimes we call them keywords in a more neutral sense, are, in fact, a form of theorizing that gets attached to the data and as plays a very important role in how we end up interpreting the data and making them a part of our understanding of the world. So this is a schema that summarizes um, the ways in which we may think about uh, knowledge production and the role of data knowledge production. We can think of the researchers interact with the world, produce some objects, which are then processed to become data. These data are ordered to then become models, which are taken to be some representation of the world. And these models then are interpreted to create knowledge, which informs further interactions with the world and so on and so forth. Now, one of the things I think that is important to note is that the notion of theory in all of this has been taken to be sort of sitting at the center of this kind of cycle, it being in fact particularly related to the idea of knowledge. But uh, one of the things that I think recent philosophy of science and certainly my own work has uncovered in the last um, 20 years or so is the fact that we can find theory at every single step of this cycle of inquiry. And what I want to focus on is the kind of theoretical and conceptual structures that we attach to the data themselves, even before they get um, clustered uh, as data models. So uh, this, in a sense, is a kind of one of the oldest challenges of scientific research, but it's also one of the newest frontiers in data science per se. Uh, we are looking at situations where very often, I think Maria's uh, research was a wonderful example of this, we have to link 
highly varied, cultural embedded terms, which are supposed to be associating data, for instance, in the biological realm, uh, to phenotypic or genotypic traits, or phenomena of all sorts, biological phenomena of interest. So in uh, my work, we've been looking particularly at the cases of personalized medicine, and specifically the clinical use of genomic data for the diagnosis of cancer. And we've been looking at cases from precision agriculture. So the integration of lots of different kinds of results uh, coming from field trials around the world uh, with genomic data coming from uh, uh, laboratory experiments to try and help um, the choice of uh, which plants to breed and uh, which crops to grow and how. So one example of the use of semantics in this area, for instance, is here in the use of bioontologies. This is one of them called the crop ontology, where you're trying to assign um, names to, in this case, uh, different parts of this cassava plant, this cassava root you see represented here, uh, so that you can then attach specific data sets to those keywords and uh, be able to structure them so you can create models and interpret the data. Now, uh, the contention we have in our project is that this kind of um, uh, semantics is, is playing, continues to play an absolutely crucial role in making data sets interoperable. And it does it in a variety of ways, which I've listed here. So data semantic systems determine certainly how data are incorporated into machine learning algorithms, because it determines how these algorithms search for the data and uh, pick them up, which data are actually linked with each other and how that happens. Uh, they determine which claims and about what data are taken as evidence for, because of course, each of these keywords that we attach data to are uh, basically prospectively a phenomenon that we want the data to be attached to in our interpretation. Uh, data semantic systems also determine whose knowledge is actually legitimized or excluded by data science and AI, because they make a choice about uh, which terms, which kind of concepts we choose to adopt or not. And in fact, uh, they determine whose perspective tends to be incorporated in data-driven knowledge systems. So they play a very, very important role. And more specifically, they inform key aspects of data science and its applications. They inform the choice of uh, which types of expertise and domains are regarded as relevant to shaping the ways in which we uh, organize data mining procedures and the results. Uh, they inform the development and the specifications of data infrastructures, including what is actually viewed as an essential knowledge base for the mining of data. And they do inform the governance of how we disseminate data and reuse data through these infrastructures. Now, uh, one of the big problems I think that everybody in the field has been dealing with, and again, is a very, very old philosophical problem, is the problem of how do you put together an exercise in classification where you're trying to classify very diverse items um, with an exercise where you're trying to some extent to provide standards that unify a field. So there is some trouble uh, in doing this in principle already. Um, this has been a long-term aspiration, even in the field of archive science and library science, to try and develop a unique semantic system that can embrace the whole of knowledge. Of course, standards are absolutely essential here. They're a crucial motor of interoperability. I mean, as Google demonstrates every moment of the day. Um, but there is a very short step between standardizing data systems and going towards a sort of monism, so a unique classificatory system. That would be a big problem. I think that has been demonstrated uh, very many times in, in recent work in data science, because whenever one agrees on a set of standards, there is to some extent a loss of system specific information that may matter uh, quite a lot when it comes to interpreting the data. So the key here is striking a balance or a trade-off, if you want, between how can we standardize classification systems, but also retain enough information about the domains and the objects in the world that we want to um, be able to um, know and um, know better through the data that can actually um, make our systems work. In fact, there is a lot of trouble in practice. Um, there is a huge variety of stakeholders and data sources and locations play in this kind of question. And this inevitably results in a proliferation of classification systems. We have many, very many classification systems. Uh, biology is a very good testing ground for that because there, I mean, one of the ideas is that in fact, very often each own lab has got its own classification system for things. And that means that there's increasing tensions among different interest groups around which systems to actually adopt. 
standards help certainly to make data classifications user-friendly, but there's always questions around uh, who is excluded whenever a standard is implemented and what it means in terms of demarcating expertise and negotiating boundaries between different kinds of research work. Also, a lot of our empirical research has shown that um, the most data reused by uh, communities in working in biomedical sciences and biological sciences happens when these communities have actually been to some extent involved in developing data infrastructures in the first place. And this very often is precisely because that gives um, researchers an understanding of how the semantic systems that are used in these data infrastructures actually function. And this greatly enhances their ability to interact uh, with databases and data systems and uh, use them for their own purposes. So very briefly going through some of the key insights that we take from philosophical, uh, ongoing philosophical debate on what we call scientific pluralism. So the idea that you have, in fact, lots of different perspectives um, in the world, many scientific perspectives too, and you want to be able to create a system where this perspective can talk to each other and can be used to scrutinize each other so that you can improve uh, the scientific system. One of the key ideas has been to try and tailor the research to the world as much as possible. And this seems like a platitude, but in fact, um, the idea that um, the, way, the way in which um, the target system that uh, researchers are discussing and collecting data about, in fact, has an influence on what kind of data then gets collected is very, very important. Uh, so not any data system will work for any uh, domain or for any type of object or event or process that one tries to understand. And uh, in fact, uh, one important thing to note here is that very often the targets of an investigation of research are actually decided as the investigation proceeds. Um, and this is very often what we associate as a surprising result of an investigation. And so it's very difficult to work with a system in which all the targets, all the phenomena are already completely predefined semantically uh, in the data system. These kinds of openness needs to be taken into account. Also, of course, uh, naming practices and um, actually labeling things in the world comes loaded with different kinds of interests and values by different stakeholders. This needs to be taken into account when building a data system. And um, it's very important to identify what kinds of broad problems a certain data system is supposed to answer. Of course, we're trying to enhance as much as possible the reusability of our systems, but ultimately every type of database or data platform contains a particular set of perspectives and values and problem agendas that, they, that it needs to solve. So it's very important to be very upfront about this, particularly when we are building interoperable systems that link very different databases that were built for uh, different purposes. Also want to really try and understand in a broader sense, what kind of more general system of practice uh, these uh, particular data systems are part of or are becoming part of? And generally try to acknowledge diversity um, as something which in fact drives science, drives the production of knowledge. So we call it an epistemic driver. So in that sense, um, some of the conclusions we are driving towards is the fact that it's very, very important to build data semantic systems, which are as much as possible problem driven and make it clear what kind of problem they were devised to address. And also they are explicitly value laden. So again, making it clear what kind of values, what kind of interests that were um, built to address and to tackle. This helps uh, people who are trying to build uh, interoperable systems and link to these uh, data semantic systems to in fact uh, do um, a reliable job. And it helps to uh, build ultimately um, inclusive and diverse and also specific uh, systems of practice. Just to give you one quick example uh, before my time is completely over. Um, one of the systems that we've been working with is the global system of um, data linkage infrastructure standards and semantics, which is now being developed in the field of um, uh, biology and particularly uh, plant biology and, and agriculture and, and agronomy. And these are uh, typically supported by international consortia in agencies, which allow for sort of international work and collaborative work uh, to happen as much as possible. And they're very much um, aimed at trying to improve the reach, the comprehension, 
resources and indeed the ability of global data resources. And to do this, one strong emphasis has been to try and assemble multidisciplinary, multi-stakeholder teams that include people from outside of research, which can then discuss uh, what are the best semantics, among other things, uh, to be used for these kinds of data linkage infrastructures. And one of the things that I think has been a great development in this area is the development of so-called communities of practice, which bring together very different kinds of stakeholders well beyond uh, technical experts in these kinds of systems to consult over how does one share knowledge about the domain area, how does it improve the fairness of the data, uh, both in terms of making them reusable, but also in terms of actually um, ensuring um, equality and responsibility in data sharing practices, and also to address um, questions around how does one harmonize different kinds of concepts and nomenclatures used around the world to refer to these kind of, any kinds of practices so that actually you create a system which is highly standardized but still uh, plural enough to embrace the diversity of these systems. So uh, I will just leave you with um, um, note that uh, many of this, uh, much of this work and many of our collaborators have been publishing work in this volume on data journeys in the sciences, which is about to be, become available in an open access format with Springer in the, in the coming month. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sabina, for a very interesting talk. Um, we have uh, time, two minutes for questions. If, um... Anyone wants to ask? I don't see, uh, hang on, any questions here on the, oh, it's um, Matthew. Matthew Brett wants to, to have a question, which I cannot see. <laughs> uh, perhaps Matthew, you can, you can write your question. So I can, um, I can ask uh, Sabina. Um, I'm afraid I see a name, Sabina, but I don't see the question. Um, so uh, I, I, in the sake of, I perhaps, um, uh, I, well, we have just one minute left. So um, let me see if it's any, is anybody else who wants to ask a question? Hi, Sophia, I've got a question actually. Yeah, please, yeah. Hi, um, so, um the so i think you know uh, we also sign up to the fair principles and it'd be great if all data was findable but it seems to actually becoming more difficult because data often concerns uh individuals now um and uh so i work in the kind of medical area it it's actually extremely difficult to often share the data that was used to develop some system. Um, and in the end, the data kind of becomes implicit in the system rather than available itself. So, so it's not so much about having the data, it's more that you have some system that was designed from data. The data is kind of in the system, but then how can you really kind of ensure this, you know, what was done, was that data gathered in a sort of fair, you know, does it represent diversity, et cetera, becomes really difficult because you have to kind of understand how that system was put together. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Magnus, for this. So I think this is one of the problems with sometimes um, having systems which sort of make um, whatever has been done to build them completely opaque. And um, I mean, what we've seen in our um, empirical work, I mean, I haven't at the time, I haven't even tried to talk about the specific case studies because it would take me a long time, um, much longer than this talk would have allowed. But what we've seen consistently is that in particular in the biomedical realm, whenever people were really um, trying to use um, existing biomedical data to open new areas of research, to, do it, to, um, to produce reliable, important findings, um, they really ultimately needed to go and dig back and get deep into where it actually came from. And what we also seen is that in those cases, that became a huge obstacle because it, it created an enormous delay in the release of some of these results, because indeed it was extremely difficult to find the sources, to track the data backwards. I mean, we've seen over the five years of this project, how incredibly difficult it was for us to do this. I mean, we basically had to use qualitative interviews as snowballing uh, to be able to capture this. And so that's why for me it's become very important to try and point out as much as possible. And of course, we collaborate with lots of fantastic platforms who are doing exactly that. It, so, for, so, 
So, so we sort of need to systems, even if sometimes it takes longer to develop them in this way that is worth it <laughs> because um, because ultimately we have seen on the reuse side that this makes a very big difference to users so so we need to kind of track some provenance of the data used to create systems because it's hard to reverse engineer and i think in genomics and medicine there's often huge biases in data sets like uk biobank or genomic data sets are primarily European uh, and, you know, uh, genomes and so on. Absolutely. Uh, and I think that's never been a problem in the history of science. There's always bias in a data set. The problem appears when the bias is impossible to track. And we have yeah. 200 years of history in becoming extremely good at tracking bias. So it's a pity to lose it now because of a bad setup. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, well, I think we are past the time. There is a question, though, if you want to answer in very quickly. It's about um, uh, if, it, if you have an analysis of our current state of maturity in UK data science, in the sense that you're describing, and how would you change the UK's current approach to improve data wisdom? Perhaps this has already been answered, but perhaps very quickly, Sabina, in half a minute. Really quick, because of course it's a big question. Thank you, Sophia. But I think question, yeah, there, are, there, are there is incredible expertise in the UK at this moment in time concerning data semantics and how to set up data systems. And many people have been instrumental in setting them up, for instance, as part of the Research Data Alliance and many other organizations in the UK who are doing this. And I'm not sure that this is actually being capitalized within the UK as a national research system as much as it could be and it should be. Um, so I think, you know, even within organizations like the Alan Turing Institute, there is discussion around data semantics, but I don't think as much as there could be. And that also goes for governmental organizations. And so I think the expertise is there, but we need to probably put much more emphasis in trying to um, use it properly. Okay, um, thank you very much. So we are 